Alexander Gill is the editor of Canada's Best New Bars. She's also the British Columbia restaurant critic for The Globe and Mail, a role she's held since 2005. But since COVID, her coverage for The Globe has shifted a little, from reviews to profiles of restaurant owners and farmers, features about food waste and supply chains, news pieces about the red tape around reopening restaurant patios, and even dancing by yourself in BC's recently reopened clubs turned lounges. But even though she's a lucky journalist who still has a job right now, as media have cut budgets because of loss advertising revenue, she's still seeing that job change. What is the role of a restaurant critic post-COVID? And how do you judge the best bars if readers are too scared to go? With hopefully all of the answers for my millions of questions, here's Alex. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's great. Um, before we get to chat about um, what what's happening with bars and restaurants out West and what you think is coming in the future, I think you have a special wine to introduce today for our oh, happy hi. hour. Some BC wine, uh, Howling Bluff Sauvignon Blanc. This is from the Naramata Bench in the Okanagan. We are very supportive of our BC wineries here. And this one's uh, really nice and uh, crisp. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very New Zealand in style, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I read a little bit about it and they're organic and they use biodynamic practices. I don't think they're certified biodynamic, but it looked like a really nice, sustainable winery. Yeah, and it is. They do wonderful Pinot Noirs. And um, it's interesting, that area of the Okanagan, it's kind of in the south, and they've got very, very steep benches. Um, mm -hmm. and they get a lot of direct sun, um, but they've got really rich soil. It's it's so steep because of the way the glaciers um, just carve through that area. And they have differences from... Um, from plot to plot, you know, mm -hmm. and it, some of them have a very heavy glacial deposit and some are a lot more sandy. And, um, you know, I've had Pinot Noirs that were grown, some of the grapes were grown just on like one segment of the winery and like 300 feet away, there's a different plot and a different soil type and the profiles are completely different. Mm -hmm. It's really, I mean, you really understand terroir when you when you start getting digging deep into that that type of a microclimate. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like we could have a whole conversation just about <laughs> wine. We're here to talk about food, but how yeah, how can you be a, a food critic without enjoying the complexities of wine? I guess and getting into terroir, but uh, for another podcast anyway. I'll, uh, I'm having uh, not a local wine, unfortunately. Um, I I should get something from Quebec for our future program because Quebec wines are, are picking up. Um, but I have something from a local private importer. Uh, this is from Origine, uh, the importer, and it's the Saint-Père d'Ambiga. It's a Catalonian, uh, uh, Ca Carlania cellar. Um, yeah, so it's Maccabeo and Trepat, uh, an indigenous grape that I really like. And, and I discovered that back at a wine salon a couple years ago, which we don't have currently. Unfortunately, yeah. wine salons are not happening, but it's a, it's a wonderful wine that you can get in Quebec from Origine. But uh, Sante, cheers. cheers. <laughs> have you done any Zoom tastings? I did a sake Zoom webinar. Uh, last week with uh, Metropolitan Premium Wines and, and Sakes, but I haven't done a lot of um, a lot of wine tastings. I know Veronique Rivet has uh, is involved with some, and I've been wanting to to see what she's up to. What about you? No, I haven't done any of that yet. Uh, yeah, but my girlfriends. I was out with some friends yesterday, and they were talking about doing whiskey tastings online. So oh, yeah. Okay, so let's go. Let's. You, you just really said something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you just said something really interesting. You were out with your girlfriends. It sounded like you were out at a bar. You were out with out at a restaurant. What's it like out west right now? Are you going out constantly? I've been out a lot in the last two weeks. I mean, yesterday part we of the job. <laughs> yeah, we were we were at, in the park, and the parks are open up, and everyone was drinking wine, and we just ordered a pizza and sat in the grass, and there was a band playing, and it was actually. I mean, I live right next to Stanley Park and the, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a beautiful day after a rainy Saturday and it really opened up. It, it was, the parks are busy and it's nice. Um, mm -hmm. Parks board haven't allowed um, public drinking in the park. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, because in Quebec, we can, if you're at a picnic table officially, and there was a big kerfuffle years ago about you had to be drink you had to be eating substantial food. It couldn't be hummus and vegetarian things. So that was, vegetarians went, went, went mad. But now it's perfectly acceptable to drink in pretty much every park. But I didn't think it was out West. So is it just kind of like, you know, people don't, don't say anything? No, or? I've been enforcing it. I've been drinking in parks since April. Yeah. <laughs> and where they, else are you going to They do? won't sanction it. They won't make it legal, but it's kind of ridiculous because everybody is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. It must, it's, 
I don't want to say it's you know good for mental health to be drinking, but it's good for mental health for people to be out with with friends, exactly. socializing and relaxing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what about in restaurants? What's going yeah, on? Um, I went to a bar on Saturday. Oh my gosh. That, that just fills me with anxiety and also excitement. That sounds wonderful. I know it's almost become, it's almost gotten to the point in just a few weeks. Uh, it's amazing how the memory forgets. I never yeah. forget just how anxious I was a few weeks mm. ago. Um, but you know, everything's opening up slowly and the bars were allowed to reopen uh, last week. And so this was a new concept it's called Bar Chickety, and it's in the space where Juke Fried Chicken used to be. And so they're still doing their takeout fried chicken, and they do, they're do they doing bonkers business and delivery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they, they had a very small dining room, about 36 seats, and they had had this idea of turning it into a bar before. And they thought now is a perfect opportunity because just for 30, it was expensive, 36 seats. They had yeah. to have two cooks in the kitchen just serving you know, the restaurant and they had to have six people on staff, but they've done it with, um, uh, Justin Tisdale is one of the owners and he's done it with Sabrine, um, Dollywell. And she is a, you know, a well-known bartender here. And she's created, like, she was in a visor so she could still taste the drinks behind a plexiglass at the bar. So we sat at the bar and there's a plexiglass divider and they have kind of an 80s theme so they're doing you know everything is like based on like you know it's a very mammy vice neon and you know the drinks were very modern though mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh so you you order on your app you order on the phone and then they and you say i'm sitting at they, every seat table hat was named after a bartender in an 80s film Mine was Lloyd. I don't even know what film it was from, but <laughs> that Lloyd table. And then they bring you the drinks. You order online, they bring it to you. And then you, if you want chicken from the place next door, you order that through their regular online service. And then they just bring it to your table in a paper bag though, with okay. like, yeah, like, as you would get it at home. Okay, so this, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but m my question is, how do you ask questions? Because um, yeah, I'm sure you ask a million questions too. Yeah, and you have to ask them about five times because she can't hear you behind the plastic. Right. It was a lot of, could you repeat that? Excuse me, I'm sorry I don't hear you. It was, that became a little frustrating and it's going to be, but I've noticed it in restaurants as well. Some, everyone's got a different mask on and some of them really muffle the sound and you just have to be patient because yeah. it's hard enough to breathe behind those masks, let alone talk and right. move around and be yeah. active. It's like exercising basically in a mask. Mm -hmm. So I feel really sorry for the servers. But the shield was a good concept so that she could actually taste the drinks. And I, you know, I hope, I wonder if more people in restaurants, or cooks in kitchens are using those because then they can actually taste their food, but they still have a protective barrier. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And you wrote about that in, in one of your pieces. I, I, I liked your piece um, on kind of advice for when you do go back to restaurants, you yeah. know, be patient, be respectful. Um, don't don't respect the time limit. Uh, expect a little bit slower service. What are some of the other tips that you've kind of incorporated into your going out routine? <laughs> routine. How novel. Very generously. Yeah, like 20, 25% like a standard because even I'm tipping on takeout too, because mm. people aren't, um, I always tipped on takeout, but, um, I mean, they've got, you know, they're, 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 they're doing half the sales that they normally do. And these, these servers are dependent on tips. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm tipping a lot. Um, I'm making reservations and you know what? I love it. That's one silver lining for COVID is that I can actually make reservations again. So, <laughs> so usually in Vancouver, it's not a problem. Nobody makes, res you know, you know, you know, nobody makes reservations, you roll up. But in the last decade, we've certainly seen this trend where restaurants don't have reservations anymore because it helps them, you know. Yeah. Turn tables, make a little bit more money. Learning. But yeah. now restaurants are having to adapt and everyone's making a reservation and you have to make a reservation two weeks in advance wow. <laughs> to St. Lawrence, which is sort of a, a La the weekend before last and it's a f sort of a fine dining uh traditional quebecois and uh classical french cuisine and um you know i had to reserve two weeks in advance and i still could only go on a sunday that seems like it might be is that an exception though because that's one of that just got number whatever in the top 100 it was before. It was just before it's number two oh okay so even before okay yeah, it was before that and um 
but they're very popular and they don't, you know, they have half the seats that they used to. And yeah. it was always hard to get a reservation there before. Okay. And now it's probably harder. Yeah. yeah. So that's a huge change with COVID then. Yeah. We're reducing dining capacity in restaurants. Um, you've been out a lot, but I know a lot of places haven't opened yet. Um, what, what's the percentage of restaurants open in Vancouver right now? You know, I don't know. It's hard to keep a handle on that because they're opening by the day. Yeah. But I would say, well, less than half are open. I would say. Okay. I, they keep they keep opening every. And I'm I'm talking to restaurant tours who two weeks ago, Kisatanto, they just opened up for takeout. Like, um, they decided to sit it out and they didn't do takeout. They just started takeout about a few weeks ago. And now this week, I'm going for a, sort of a a test dinner in the dining room. But the chef owner said to me like three weeks ago, we're not doing dine-in. I just can't see it. It does. It's not us. I don't, I can't imagine, you know, you know, semi-fine dining with a mask and table spread apart. The finances mm -hmm. don't make money, make, make sense, but everyone's coming on board slowly. If they want to survive, they have to. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the question. Like are, how many of these places are going to make it? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, now we're seeing about 20% closure, 10 to 20% closure already. Yeah, according to Restaurants um, Canada, yeah, already. Yeah, already. Um, I think 50%, unfortunately, is a fair estimate if there's, a second, if there's, if a, second there's a second wave. And, and, and everything will depend on that. Yeah. A lot of restaurants are making a go of it with, ta with a combination of takeout and reduced capacity dine-in and now expanded patios and like over 80 expanded patios have been improved in, yeah. in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, you have to shake up your business model. And like even St. Lawrence is now doing merchandise. They're doing their, you know, their trademark spice rubs and salts and, you know, yeah. you know, you, you have to do a lot of different things. You have to have multiple streams of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but some are doing it and some are doing it quite successfully. Uh, a lot of restaurants don't want to say they're making a killing in takeout, but some <laughs> Are. They are good for them, <laughs> and um, because they don't have the same staffing, you know. Um, not everyone. We don't want to be ordering. I don't want to be or eating takeout for the you know for forever. Um, people, some but, but some people just aren't ready to go back into restaurants, and um, you know, for restaurants that w want to make it in the long haul, they're going to have to find different ways of doing things. Yeah. I think the, the question for me, there was a, there was a piece, I forget if it was, I think it was the New Yorker, um, about whether this is really just the economy catching up to an unsupportable industry and that it wasn't financially viable before margin marginally. And this just showed some, so much of the unfairness in the industry and how tight margins were. But do, do you think that that's fair to say, or, or is, is this really, um, just mean and, and harsh or, or a reality check. Well, somewhere in the yeah, I think the restaurant system was broken. Yeah. It has been for a long time. Um, in North America, um, there's been this boom, everyone's interested in restaurants, everyone's mm. interested in, in dining. And this is, a, you know, it's, it's been called like the last decades for the golden age of dining. Um, but it's not golden if it's not profitable and nobody should be running a business if they're making less than 10% profit. But, you know, it becomes a labor of love, a, a form of artistic expression. And mm -hmm. there is that element to, to dining. Fine dining has never really made money. If you look at any of the Michelin <laughs> restaurants, right? I mean, there's just the costs, the overhead are huge. And uh, you just can't fit that many people in the dining room to make it profitable. And any of the Michelin, like three Michelin starred restaurants, I mean, they were making money on their cookbooks and their, you know, their, their sibling restaurants that were more casual. Those restaurants haven't made money for a long time, but you can have an industry where nobody makes money. <laughs> um, it's been an overheated market. There's a lot of cities, I mean, especially Vancouver, where the real estate is so expensive. Um, you have too many restaurants trying to serve um, a limited market. Um, if you can't afford to pay your people, your employees properly, there's a problem. With, with the basic model. Um, if you can't attract people to the industry, um, as, as kitchen restaurants have been finding, they can't get the young the millennials don't want to work in the kitchen because it's a, yeah. basically a shit job. Um, <laughs> you know, unless yeah. you are very passionate about cooking and have dreams of opening your own restaurant. I mean, there, something has to change. 
And we already saw in Vancouver, especially a shift to more casual dining to counter service, to take out models, to mm -hmm. hybrid models, where you'd be a coffee shop and breakfast place in the morning, um, you know, a, a, a natural wine bar, wine bar by night, um, you know, cocktails in the evening, you know, take up bread subscriptions and, you know, all sorts of different things. And I think we need to, to see more of that because not every restaurant can be a sit down, intimate, cozy, farm to table restaurant using very expensive organic food and trying to keep it at a decent price. People haven't been charging enough for food. Um, and they, you know, and they just, this is a reset. I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. It's really, really sad. That's it's horrible. You know, the people have poured their, you know, their blood, sweat, their tears into, into their places of business. And a lot of people aren't going to make it, but we're seeing that's going to happen across the entire economy too. Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing that a lot in, in Montreal. We're known for having such a high percentage of, of restaurants per capita here. And I, I looked at Vancouver to, and I wonder, is that what's going to happen here in, in Montreal in terms of people having anxiety or being excited at first to go out to restaurants and then it slows down and then it picks up again? Like, what, what do you think the wave could be like? Yeah, well, I, I mean, Montreal is in a better position because the rents are a lot more reasonable. Most That's places. true. That is true. It, it, it makes a substantial difference. Mm. Um, but, sorry, so you wanted to know, are people going to get excited about coming out and then... Yeah, like, what what was the opening like in Vancouver? And if, if you have an opinion on if that'll be the same I mean, I, it hasn't been busy. There are lineups outside of some places. The chain restaurants are attracting huge lineups. <laughs> I don't really understand that because... <laughs> But it's just as expensive and it's half the quality. Uh, but um, they're doing really well. People like uh, in Vancouver, people like their, you know, their, their homogenous cuisine. You know, it's like the Starbucks. There's a lot of um, a lot of chains that are very popular. Okay, well, um, some Starbucks have been closing down here too. So we'll see too, what happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but people are, they're not being overrun. They're not overwhelmed. And I wrote okay. about that recently that restaurants, you know, are surprised. They thought people would be itching to get out yeah, and just right away. Picking up and, and say, okay, there are exceptions. St. Lawrence is, you know, right. you know, re, you know, busy until like the end of August, basically. Okay. But, um, uh, you know, the other restaurants aren't at even their full capacity, the reduced full capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to, it's going to become, I hate to say it, but very Darwinian, you know, the, uh, survival of the fittest kind of. Yeah. And um, people are looking for experiences that are either comforting. Um, I think right now, um, that was my first dining experience. I just went to something that I knew was going to be easy. It was where, did, where did you go? Yeah, I went to Nook. Oh, and, yeah. Uh -huh. and, and I just know it's, it's going to be good. And it's going to be a fun environment. Like the music was loud. People, the servers were funny. I just felt like oh, it was a good place to just like, you know, tear that bandaid off because mm. <laughs> so, I felt comfortable going there. Yeah. Um, but what, I, what I'm talking to people and they're like, mm, I'm not interested in pizza and pasta. People want uh, something they can't cook at home because everyone's cooking at home. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> made their sourdough uh, pizza dough now or, or yeah. baguette or whatever. <laughs> What you cook at home maybe people don't i mean for me i've tried a lot of pizza at home i don't have a pizza oven so pizza is kind of exotic for me <laughs> but, but um uh, uh you know people are looking for there's a few new restaurants opening there are dozens of restaurants opening that they're uh, the rest of their opening had been put on hold okay that so that's well, yeah, yeah and and that's really exciting now are you excited as a restaurant critic and are you going to approach them as you would you know a year ago six months ago i haven't decided yet on oh. that. what to do because Put it here I first want to i mean i i did i, I did i sort of copped out and did a review like a sort of a an advanced story on how difficult it is to open up a new restaurant in this, in the age of a pandemic. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, you kind of like squeezed it into a quasi review and that was fine. But I didn't talk about the food or anything. No. Like, oh, I, not much. I mean, I talked about how the menus had to be adjusted, but these aren't, haven't opened yet. So I'm like, well, I'm really looking forward to going to them, but mm -hmm. you know, for any restaurant I review, I would wait three months. 
so I wouldn't go in right away because they, they're, they're going to have to figure things out. Right. Menus change after the first few weeks. Things yeah. system, They need time to get their systems in place. Yeah. You can't give uh, consumers an accurate snapshot. So let's hope these restaurants, let's hope they even make it three months. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, maybe things change dramatically in three months in terms of people feeling comfortable in restaurants, servers feeling comfortable. All of a sudden they're more naturally personable again, and you can actually laugh and not worry about <laughs> coughing on someone and not worry about yelling at your friend across the table. And uh, who, yeah, who knows what will happen. But even like you said, the, the idea of a bar, um, going to a bar for, for Montrealers right now is, is either exciting or anxiety ridden. Um, so y- you had a gala actually last week for, for Canada's best bars. How do you, how do you announce great bars right now? Yeah, well, we didn't. <laughs> no, I mean, we had, it was part of Canada's 100 best. Mm-hmm. And so I had like a three minute um, sort of five minute really sort of over you know uh introduction to the bars and one of the bars was open one of the bars on our list was open the um lobby lounge in the pacific um fairmont pacific rim in downtown oh that's supposed to be beautiful so they had just opened the day before Mm -hmm. so i thought oh everyone's like just doing this we had and we had chefs from across the country who are accepting awards by Zoom, just like this, from their living room or wherever right. they were, or their offices or their kitchens. And we, I said, well, let me go on location. I'm probably the only one who can go on location. Right, yeah. <laughs> and um, so we went- Live from an actual restaurant. And the, yeah, we actually had a drink and it was delicious. And I was able to invite um, our bartender of the year, who was, happened to be in Vancouver and worked for the same hotel to come in say a few words and accept his award. So that was fun, but it was everybody in Toronto when I, I, I said, oh, why don't I do this? And I suggested it. They're like, what's it gonna be like? Are you gonna have to wear a mask? I'm like, no, I don't have to wear a mask. And I realized, oh my God, we are so fortunate because we are really ahead of the whole entire country right now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I said, no, you don't have to wear a mask when you go into a restaurant. Uh, the servers are all wearing masks though. <laughs> yeah. Bought. And it was a big bar. It was a hotel lobby bar. They had a huge space. They didn't at the time have anybody sitting at the actual bar counter, but they have a ton of tables. And they were bringing in a musician in the evening and doing live music. And But, you know, it's not, I think bars are, have it even tougher. Mm, uh, yeah. yeah I, because you go to a bar I for the, so. the convivial atmosphere. You want to be squeezed in next to strangers. You want it to be loud and rowdy a little bit, you know, even in a, in a, even in a, in a lounge, the idea is like people watching to watch everybody around you. And there's none of that right now. Yeah. And the bar chickadee experience was interesting. Um, the drinks were delicious, uh, but was it a bar experience as we know it? No. I'd love to see more outdoor bars. I'd love to see like, you know, the bars spill out onto the sidewalks and then, that might give more of a, a European feeling, a flair. Mm. Uh, that would be nice. But to be inside a bar with everybody wearing visors behind plexiglass. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. And and I, I when you say that, I all I can think is not in our winter. I, I mean, maybe you can do heated patios and like that expense could be justified throughout the winter, but in Montreal, I mean, restaurants are gonna have bars, especially are gonna have a hard time when it hits minus 30. But they do it at ski resorts all the time. That's true, that's true. But I feel like they have money at ski resorts because they- There's no, yeah, there's no, you know, there's no mini skirts and high heels, you know, you're yeah. in your park and you're big Sorel boots, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, actually, well, speaking of being outside, I don't know if you do some of your food tours outside, but you were doing a number of food tours more recently. And I'm, I'm curious, because I, I, I worked for a food co- a tour company here in Montreal too, and, you know, we're not doing anything right now. So I'm wondering what you're doing. I'm not doing anything. That's on no. right now. I mean, okay. there are no tours. I have a I mean, I think it's on pause right now. I think I'll still offer if somebody is coming to town, then, you know, I have to change my website and say, you know, custom private tours only. I mean, I was going in that direction anyways, only private tours. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think it's good to get into a car with somebody right now. And I was doing a lot of like chauffeur driven tours to get people off the beaten track. Right. And I don't think uh, anybody wants to do that right now. 
Maybe not. No. Although I wasn't an Uber on Saturday. It was pretty cool, but <laughs> you'd have to have a lot of partitions, right? Um, I, if you're doing a private group, then those are people traveling together. So who knows? Uh, but I think I might do some walking tours, but I'm not counting that on that as a stream of revenue this summer. It was just beginning to make money. And I was like excited about it. There's sort of high end custom group tours that I do. And, uh, but that's just all on pause now. There's oh. not, there will be tourism. I think they're announcing this week that um, we see is opening up. Okay. So for tourism, so I mean, but how much of that will be there? Yeah. And how much of the high end market? Well, maybe more of the high end market. Well, that's, I, I was just talking to somebody about that and they said, what happens to fine dining? And I said, you know what? I think there'll be a lot of, um, the chefs will be doing just fine. I think they will have be booked out solid every weekend to do catering events at people's homes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it will become very exclusive and that sort of thing. So you could do some custom things and I don't know. I don't think anybody in the tourism industry is, it's going to be tough. <laughs> I, I think I'll, I'll make it available, but I'm not count. I'm, I mean, I'm, I think I'll, I'll just continue writing a lot more about, um, there's lots to write about. Yeah. Oh, and you have been writing very diverse uh, subject matter. I loved your, your profile of, of supply chains and, and farmers. Um, uh, what was the, um, Paul, is it Paul Healy? What, the hand farm, yeah. 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 I've been to that farm and it's so beautiful and it just broke my heart with all the wasted produce that he couldn't sell. His greens, his salad greens are incredible. Well, yeah. They're like you know, cream of the crop for sure. Yeah. But he's at home now. It, it was well, a yeah. times just last weekend and I had written a couple of things on these lines where this is like the best time for, you know, home cooks because you can eat restaurant quality food, mm. not just the takeout kits and the meal kits and partly cooked kits. Then there are great things like that, but you can also, get, I've been getting like, um, you know, great uh, seafood um, and steaks. And I've been doing all my grocery shopping through restaurants who are, who have pivoted to sort of um, pantry items and you can get um, a mix of things. You can get like a partly, you know, a stuffed, I was getting like a, a roast chicken stuffed with truffles that uh, a steakhouse here does, Elisa. Mm. And then oh, Elisa, you know, yeah, I heard about yeah. that one. Yeah, and would, you know, it's probably it's a steak restaurant that's really well known for their chicken. <laughs> so you can get those, you know, partially prepared chickens at home for like not, like the same price as you'd pay for a regular broiler at, at a grocery store. Right. And you could get, um, you know, and then a, a, you know, a, a pre-cooked lasagna, you just stick in the freezer and then you could get granola and coffee mm. and salad greens and, you know, prime USDA prime steaks and uh, all these great things. You, I, I've been doing all of my grocery shopping until like this weekend uh, through, uh, through restaurants. And I'll, oh, wow. I'll continue doing that because the prices are right. And there are several restaurants who have pivoted that way. So, I mean, the, but the supply chain is a, a serious problem because those, there aren't, fishermen aren't fishing in Vancouver really? uh, because they can't, there's not enough market overseas for them. Right. Uh, a lot of export. There's yeah. no restaurants and, you know, it, everything's just, everything's seized up. Okay. So, um, probably good for the ocean, not so good for the, for, for the workers. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of labor issues going on. It's not just migrant labor, but people who are out of work, yeah. the farmers and, you know, are destroying the crops. And these are, these are going to have long-term repercussions. And I mean, the farmers in Saskatchewan, like sort of grain farmers and, you know, people who grow chickpeas and lentils and legumes. I mean, everything they're they've sold everything in advance right they they sell futures but now so everything's just sort of they're, they're paid like they, their systems work in like six months ahead of time but are people going to be ordering are they going to be able to to sell yeah. the, this summer's crop are they going to have enough people to to to, to harvest are they going to be able to send it around the world there could be like there, there's going to be a worldwide hunger crisis there's going to be serious problems and so sometimes I think about, yeah, the restaurants, we're talking about restaurants, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And there's well, one so of the world's biggest exporters of lentils and chickpeas and those kinds of staple crops all over the world. So yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. 
he, he, he is just huge. Um, I mean, so we should just count ourselves lucky that we have restaurants to go to. That's true. And, and for now, because I mean, yeah, well, exactly. Um, and you just made me think um, we might not have people to harvest a lot of these crops and then it's planting the next crop and it's having the money to buy seeds to plant yeah. the next crop. Um, so it's kind of the same system, the same problem as restaurants. You're thinking, you know, six months from now, who else is going to fail? So I'm thinking, you know, what farms and what industries, and once people leave that labor force, are they going to go back into it? That it's such an unsustainable or, or just, you know, um, risky business right now. Well, that's why it's interesting to look at restaurants because it is a microcosm of, you know, the larger, the larger food chain and, and, um, what's happening here, you can, yeah, it's going to be amplified. Yeah. Well, I feel that we're still pretty lucky compared to the U.S. We haven't had so many major um, packing, like meat packing facilities uh, close for long periods of time. Uh, we have had a number and, and the cases are, are just so sad, but I feel, I feel like some of the news that we're hearing from the U.S., uh, they might have a little more trouble than us. I don't know. I just don't know if it's not being reported on because yeah. it's happening here. Mm -hmm. There have been outbreaks in every, even like vegetable packing plants here. So, uh, you know, the restaurant prices are going up um, because those, the plants in Alberta and the chicken processing plants in, in greater Vancouver, they're working at half capacity now. And, you know, um, so those prices are going to go up. Okay. I, I find it really interesting for you to say that when I look at the painting right behind you with the, with the oh, woman yeah. with the fish in her mouth, like kind of like a look of desperation there. <laughs> it's like, that's going to be all of us in six months, just looking for the next fish. Sink your teeth into what you can get. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can I ask you what the, what the painting is? Oh, the... it's um, um, a girlfriend of mine. Her name is Tallulah. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's a, it, it's a, she's done a series. She used to live in Japan and she did a series on geishas in Japan and then she this is a local model who's not Japanese and uh she's just like yeah powerful geisha eating raw fish it's her it's her uh yeah I love it I, I love it for your profession too. You're a food writer right yeah yeah exactly Thanks for listening to the Senka Set podcast. I know that's a pretty abrupt ending, but our conversation got so interesting that I decided to let it go a bit longer than usual and split it into two episodes. So come back next week to hear about Alex's opinion on writing negative reviews during COVID and my dismal effort once again to conduct a proper lightning round. And hey, we're looking for sponsors. So reach out on social media or wherever you get this podcast. Have a great week.